was uh, protesting outside the gates at NASA Johnson Space Flight Center. I think you might want to try insects first. It might be, might be easier. Any other suggestions? When animals do get the space, um, usually when you hold an animal over water, their legs immediately try and find some kind of stable footing. When you put them into a, like a no gravity environment, their chances are they're gonna immediately just stress out immediately, which creates lactic acids, which make their, their meat more tough. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't be as delicious as Wagyu meat. Along with that, it would probably start with that. Criticism and not be too defensive now, right? You gotta, you gotta factor this into your. Yeah, this idea is still in development. <laughs> Just don't be surprised if you're walking through Whole Foods and you don't see any moon meat packaging. It's all sold out. So, all right, all right, good job, okay. guys. I'm Nicholas Lockertilia, Alex Chase, and Rachel Dunley, and we are we took on the topic of communication to Earth. So the first question that comes up is what is the Epic Ice Challenge? So the Ice um, Method it's a way of solving problems that are related to the STEM careers, and this year our main challenge is to investigate how we can have a, uh, have another human uh, human sustainable mission back to the moon. And our group chose to focus on how do we can improve our communication um, from the moon, from the moon back to Earth, to create a successful mission. So, what is communication at Earth? So, as of now, spacecraft send information and pictures back to Earth using the Deep Space Network, which is a large collection of big radio antennas, um, evenly spaced around the world. The DSN is a major component of space communication because it receives information and the location and well-being of um, spacecrafts in space. Um, and at the information received at each DSN site gets sent to a laboratory in Pasadena, California, where the information is processed and shared with scientists and the rest of us. So why did we choose communication to Earth? Um, as a group, we decided that communication is really the first step to completing any project, especially one this big. And communicating new data and findings from experiments and uh, exploring on the moon is like crucial if we want to extend our like, knowledge and understanding of the space and the moon. And with improving communication to Earth, they'll also allow us to like improve in any other subject really, like food production, farming, and colonization. Competition that we might have are any other companies working on spacecrafts and building them because communication is vital to any spacecraft that is built and any other teams that are working on communication. This is our contact information for um, our entire group. Is anyone else doing a similar project in, in this area? There's one in Morristown. Okay. Okay. So, what do you, what do you guys foresee as the biggest challenge? Because we've been to the moon, we communicated from the moon. What do you see as the biggest challenge, or what are you? How are you trying to improve that communication? Um, so we're trying to further 
the distance between the DSN uh, radio antennas and satellites or space spacecrafts of um, space or at the moon. Um, so we know that the distance between the two have to be, you know, they have to be within a constraint and the antennas of the DSN have to be a certain size in order to maintain that communication. So we would like to further the distance between the two but still maintain a strong um, communication between them and, yeah, that's it, <laughs> yeah. So. Okay, so are you basically researching what is NASA currently looking at? How they plan on doing that? Do they plan on putting on uh, satellites uh, orbiting the moon, for instance, to help them with that? And, and also think about the different kinds of operations that are going to be required on the surface of the moon. Uh, since the since the distance is not that great, there might be a three second delay. There are things that you could do robotically on the moon. Um, using telerobotic operation that might require a different type of communication that might be important for that type of operation. So hone in on um, uh, what, what communication uh, network you're going to need based on what, what your planned mission is on the surface of the moon. If it's sustaining a colony, um, if it's going to be operating robots and, and that sort of thing. Okay, good job. There we go. Okay. Next up, we have um, transportation between Earth and the moon. focusing on is the transportation between Earth and the Moon. So I'm Joey LeClaire, I'm the team leader. Um, some traits about me, I'm hardworking, I feel like I'm a helpful leader. I play football and lacrosse. Um, I'm Elijah Crosby, um, some traits about me, I'm hardworking, outgoing, and a team player, and I enjoy playing football. Hi, I'm Devin Payne. I'm a Creative and outgoing. I play baseball. I like being part of a team. I'm uh, Mike Costello. I'm helpful, understanding, knowledgeable, and I enjoy engineering. So, our epic challenge is to design a sustainable and effective mission to the moon. So, what we're focusing on is the basic transportation between Earth and the moon, making it more effective, and making it um, easier to. So competition, there are several companies, or private companies and countries working towards the same goal of making a sustainable trip to the moon possible. And an example of this, aside from NASA obviously, is SpaceX, which is creating a vessel that can carry up to 100 passengers at a time. Uh, the reason why we chose space transportation would be because as a group we were all interested in the uh, topic of getting between Earth and uh, the moon on making it as efficient as possible by using the uh, Boeing uh, Orion capsule and the uh, NASA Space Launch System. It's important because if there is ever a future where we would like to send people onto the moon for longevity or a long period of time, we need to make it as efficient and as safe as possible so we can so we can make many trips possible. So this will require ways to safely bring food, water, machines, etc so we can get more research and make it possible. Um, we've come up with some possible difficulties that will happen in this process so that we fail less often. Um, first off would be funds. We need sponsors to help pay for this. Um, we would also be able to need to be able to take off and land in multiple conditions, uh, no matter the weather and no matter the surface we're landing on or taking off with. And we need to be able to do this multiple times. That way we can save money rather than using a rocket that can only be used once. 
Um, we're also going to need a fuel source that's renewable as well as harvestable so that we can save money and be more efficient. Uh, we, need to regulate, we need to regulate radiation, gases, and also keep breathable air on the ship. And lastly, it's natural forces are, play a big factor into any rocket taking off because we need to be able to adapt to any atmosphere and any condition. someone else that could maybe comment and maybe add something to, uh, to this team. Go ahead. systems they use that they can recycle liquid waste to turn into reusable water. Okay. The, the other thing I would think about is looking at all these other people that are trying to solve the same problem. You know, they have their, their very different ways of doing it. Understand NASA's space launch system and exactly how much that costs to run to get a pound into orbit and how much would it cost to get a pound to the moon. Look at the big picture first. Start with the big picture. What is your moon uh, colony going to look like to start with? How many people? How is it going to grow over time? And that gives you some idea how much mass you have to actually take up to orbit to get that colony started and to, and to grow that colony. Look at the other um, competitors that you mentioned, like SpaceX or Blue Origin. Look at the techniques they're using to kind of reduce the cost to getting payload to orbit and, and, and to the moon. And so what I would do is spend a lot of time researching all the different ways that people are currently looking at trying to do it and see if you can come up with something that they haven't even thought of. Okay, good job. Thank you. Next up, Lunar Base Design. All right, so I'm Caleb Oakley. Uh, this is Andre Cormier, uh, Alex Cummings, and Connor Woods. Hi, I'm Connor Woods. Uh, I'm more of the creative member of the group. This is Caleb Oakley. He's our manager and captain. He keeps everybody in line and helps us out to stay on task. Uh, we have Andre over here who helps us out, and he's very knowledgeable about, about a lot of different ideas and such, and he knows a lot about many different <coughs> on our spectrum areas. And then we have Alex, who's a creative, artistic thinker who understands a lot of different ideas. What is our epic challenge? Our portion of the epic challenge is to design a feasible moon base and to define the infrastructure necessary for sustainable long-term missions or even colonies. Our approach depends on whether we decide to do A, center around an inexpensive and efficient method for lunar construction, or B, focus on independent base design, specifically concerning stru structural integrity and radiation protection. So what is our focus? So our goal is to design a feasible moon base. And like any other structure, its primary goal is to protect from hazards and the elements. On Earth, that's you know, temperature, rain, any sort of weather. But on the moon, we have a different set of problems like solar radiation and just moon dust and just a whole different set of things. So we want to define, uh, define the infrastructure necessary for lunar construction and just overall come up with a detailed plan to protect people living on the moon. While building a lunar colony, there are a lot of obstacles that uh, there are a lot of obstacles that need to be overcome. These include uh, tons of solar radiation, which, as Dr. Marta stated earlier, can only be blocked effectively using large amounts of uh, 
very dense metal to shield against the radiation. Moon dust is also a problem due to it being being abnormally sharp and it can be a contamination risk for the base. Uh, there's the biggest problem though is the limited access to Earth because once you're up there, you're completely alone and shipping stuff to uh, the moon takes a lot of effort and resources as well. So we have multiple options for dealing with this. Uh, the first of which involves building infrastructure on the moon such as using a miniaturized thorium reactor to power a mining operation to build infrastructure there. And the other one includes a collapsible base structure so that we can save effort and money over shipping it. All right, and here's our contact information. Thank you. Good job, guys. And, and as you know, tons of people have been studying this problem. And especially folks nearby at MIT, for instance, Ali Devek is gonna be here on Saturday. He's had teams of uh, researchers, graduate students at MIT looking at this problem and also looking at it from a logistics standpoint. So if you could get some of these papers to try to predict how much some of these things will weigh, how much material you will need, and, and start just the, building those spreadsheets to try to understand you know, how much equipment are we talking about uh, getting up there? I think that will go a long way into, because you're right now you're in the conceptual design stage. So your canvas is blank, you have a lot of ideas to look at, and, and now you have to start putting some, what I call the, those uh, course kinds of analyses to predict what these different ideas or architectures, how much they will cost, and how you would operate. And that's going to play into which one you actually select. And maybe you could come up with something that's innovative that folks haven't looked, been looking at before. A lot of it entails living off 